we've been talking about some epic battles in the scriptures. The epic battle that we're going to be talking about today is the battle between Moses and the Pharaoh. It's about the Exodus. Now, I want to say some things here in regard about this story. This is perhaps second to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the most important event in all of history. As Christians, I want to encourage you to understand, comprehend, internalize this epic situation. As a matter of fact, so much of the Old Testament refers back to this story. Some of them are plain. Some of them are mere echoes. Some of them are reflection. But as you delve into this unbelievable story of redemption, and you understand the inner workings, and as you read the Old Testament, be it the Psalms or the stories that are told in all the books of the Old Testament, and certainly referred to in the New Testament, it is incumbent upon you as a follower of Christ to understand this epic, epic battle of Pharaoh and Moses, and ultimately the victory that God has brought. Some of the major religions of the world still point to this story, be it in Islam. They refer to the Exodus. Or certainly in, in Judaism, the Exodus is a central part of their faith. And certainly as Christians, we know the Exodus was emblematic and pointed toward the death, burial, burial and resurrection of our Lord. We know the story about the Exodus was ultimately the fulfillment of a promise that God made to Abraham, that God will always fulfill his promise. It's how we know today why I know for sure that my destiny is in heaven. Not because of anything that I have done, but because God is faithful to his promise, and he said, if you live like that, one day you will dwell with me for all eternity. And we know that he tells us in the scriptures that he would go to every length to fulfill his promise, including not sparing even his own son in order to fulfill this promise that God has for us. And God made a promise to Abraham. He said, Abraham, there's going to be a time when the descendants of yours are going to be so numerous. And of course, Abraham said, I don't know what you're talking about. My wife cannot have any children. And of course, we know the story very well that Abraham was blessed by God. And ultimately, his Children were as many as the sands on the seashore, as the scripture describes it. But God promised to Abraham, he said, there's going to be a period of about 400 years where you guys are going to be living as foreigners, as sojourners on this land. And of course, we know we are sojourners. We are pilgrims here on earth. This is not our home. And emblematic of that fact, Abraham, when he went to the place that he was going, he pitched the tent symbolizing that this was not his permanent home, that indeed he was looking forward to a city whose architect and builder is God himself. And we live with that expectation, and we understand that, that God will do whatever he needs to do in order to fulfill his promise. And the story of the Exodus is again the fact that he wins Victory upon victory upon victory upon victory. And to know ultimately that his promises will always be fulfilled. And that's why we can trust him. That's why we can put our faith in him. Not because man will fail you. 
but God will never fail you. So after being in, the, in uh, Egypt for 400 years, God chose a man that the Bible described was no ordinary child. He was raised in the Pharaoh's court for the first 40 years. And the Bible tells us actually in the book of Acts that Moses knew that he was chosen as God's deliverer of the people. Acts chapter 7 and verse 24. The Bible tells us that. And, AJ, and, and, and Moses saw an Egyptian brutalizing a Hebrew. He said, I can't stand for this. And so what he did, he actually slew the Egyptian and put him under and buried him under sand. And he thought, the Bible tells us, the Israelites would realize that he has been chosen to deliver the people out of Egypt and they will all rally to him. They'll all say, okay, here he is, awesome, let's get our stuff back, we're going, fellas and fellettes. But of course, the next day the Bible tells us that two of the Hebrew brothers were fighting, and he said, hey, why are you guys fighting? And they said to him, um, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? He said, people know about this? He feared for his life, and he fled. There's a story in that. Guys, sometimes even if we know that it's God's will for us to do something, the timing may not necessarily be right now. He was the right man. He had the right God with the right message. But the timing was not God's timing. And he took matters into his own hands. He said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make sure they understand. And God says, uh, not quite. He needed to understand, and for the, fir for the first 40 years of his life, he was raised in, the, in Pharaoh's court with all the wisdom of the world, and ultimately, he took matters into his own hands. And then he ran away, fearing his life. The next 40 years of Moses' life was spent in the desert, learning so many things, not the least of which, timing is important in God's plan for your life and for my life. Amen. I know if you're anything like me, one of the things that I have learned over the last few years, I prided myself as a go-getter. I want to make things happen. If not me, then who? Oh, the arrogance of that phrase. If not me, then it's someone else. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And that I get to be a part of this. That it's not some God-given birthright that I've received. And I realize God and His timing is really important. I am so absolutely elated to be in Ottawa. There are some other aspirations that I had in my life that I thought, God, you need to answer this prayer. But I am so grateful, as Garth Brooks said in his song, for unanswered prayers. Because I could not feel the Spirit of God working in our lives here in the Ottawa Church more than I do right now. It's just absolutely remarkable, and it's incredible to be a part of that. If Moses needed to understand some things. And so then God comes back to Moses, and then we pick it up in Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3 in verse 4. So Moses there is hiding out. He's, got, he's scared, and uh, he ran away from the... Egyptians because they were going to kill him. In uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 4, it says, When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, 
God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. God needed Moses' attention. So know what he did? He created a burning bush. And then he got Moses' attention. And then he called him by his name. Let me ask you a question. Just a little side note. What is the burning bush in your life right now? Is God calling your attention and you're ignoring? What is the attention in your life? And anyways, Moses comes over and Moses says, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. If there's any passage that describes who our God is, tis this one. The God saw the misery of his people. He was not oblivious, but he cared and he saw them. And the Bible says, I love the way it's phrased there, I am concerned about their suffering. There's so many times in my life when things are going on and it's tough and I wonder, God, I don't know if you've ever cried in this prayer, look at, look at what I've done. Look at what I've given up. So embarrassing to say those things, but I've, I've said them. I am do some stuff. Come on. Do you not recognize? Let me remind you and we list our accolades. Oh, my. God is concerned about us as he was with, Israel, with the Israelites. And he says, so I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out, out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 9, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God calls Moses. I like, I like what the Bible says there. God says he himself will come down and rescue them. And he sends Moses. Interesting. I tell you what, to be an instrument of God and to be used by God and to be God to people in a manner of speaking is an enormous responsibility. And so Moses naturally said, what? Do you know who I am? He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt, how many times have we been asked and God is calling us and we just doubt whether or not we are that person? So many times that we doubt whether or not we have the wherewithal, we have the education, we have the disposition, we have the money, we have the talents, we have the education, or you can fill in the blank. Can I do this? And there's so many people that I get together with and I study the Bible with, and they say to themselves, I don't know if I can live this life. This is a high calling. Do you know who I am? Do you know what my thoughts are? I know you don't see them. Do you know how evil my thoughts are? If this is true, if this is indeed true, I can't do this. That's not 
an uncommon refrain. It is a common refrain from people who have been called by God. And not something as majestic, if you would, as leading the Israelites out of Egypt, but sometimes just the issue of following Christ, or the issue of being a believer, the issue of doing something in our lives, and we wonder, man, can I do this? Look, look at my history. I come from an abandoned home. I have no money. I'm fat. You didn't have to oh, amen that, brother, exactly. <laughs> purely for illustrative purposes, okay? <laughs> but Moses, and God says a simple statement, I will be with you. Sounds familiar? I will be with you. Moses, though, still didn't believe. So God says, hey, let me just confirm with you how great I am. He says, Hey, you got a staff there? Throw it in the ground. Of course, remember, turns into a snake, right? Cool. But Moses says, all right, but are you, like, are you sure? We're talking about the Pharaoh here. Staff turning to a snake. Okay, that's cool, but is that really going to do it? He says, okay, take your hand, put it in your cloak, then pull it out. Whoa, it's leprous. Put it back in, clean again. Oh, that's cool. I can now be a magician, Lord. Are you serious? And God was trying to convince Moses. And Moses says, I don't want to go. That's, that's what he said. Lord, send somebody else. Have you ever said that? I know I have. I know when you guys wanted me to come here, I said, T find somebody else. I live in San Antonio where it's warm all the time. Why in the world would I come here when I, there's five feet of snow in April? <laughs> Everybody, when I'm changing my stuff, is saying, what are you doing here? When I tell them I'm from San Antonio, at least I was living there for a while. But Moses said, I'm not coming. He says, I can't even speak. You want me to lead these people and I can't even speak properly. And God says, okay, Moses, you're irritating me. Okay, I'm going to use your brother then, Aaron, to speak to you. In, Ex in um, Exodus 14, this is what Moses' response was in verse 13. He says, Moses said, pardon your servant. At least he was, he was a little, you know, he was apologetic and he was kind about it. He was nice about it. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. And that was his response. We pick it up in chapter 5. He says, you go and you talk to these people, and you are going to encounter some opposition. But trust me, I am with you. And of course, we realize that these miracles that were performed with Moses was a prelude to the majestic uh, plagues that were done ultimately so that the people could be freed from slavery. In chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, After, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. You know, there's so many times people in the world do not understand what we do and why we do them. At least we need to understand why we do things, okay? Uh, uh, let, let, let's not fall to their ignorances as well. But Pharaoh says, I am not going to do this. Pharaoh then said, okay, you want to let these people go? You want me to let them go? I'll show you. What I'm, how I'm going to respond to that request. I now may need them to make bricks. I used to supply their straw. Now they need to find their own straw to make bricks. 
You know, sometimes they tell you, you go and talk to your boss and you be confident and you tell him you want a raise or you want a promotion because of all of these things. And that's what Moses said. We want to be free. We want to get out of here. Okay, great. And Moses says this. And, Moses, uh, and Pharaoh said, um, I'm going to turn it up a little bit for you. And the Bible tells us that God remember his covenant and that he will keep his promise. And this begins one of the most powerful displays of God's power in the entire scriptures. Of course, we know the next few chapters talks about what's often termed the ten plagues where blood and frogs and gnats and flies and livestock and boils and hail and locusts and darkness and ultimately, of course, we know the, the, the firstborn. Interesting thing here, as I was reading this and I examined this, I've struggled at times in the scriptures with this story, asking myself this question. I don't know if you've ever asked yourself, but I've asked myself this question. Was it really Pharaoh's fault that God, because God, God hardened his heart? I mean, here's this guy that, that, did he really have a choice? But here's some food for thought. In chapter 8, in verse 15, we see Moses' request and Pharaoh's response in chapter 8 in verse 15 it says this but when Pharaoh saw that there was relief he hardened his heart and would not listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord said okay keep that note chapter 9 verse 7 he says that this is what it says Pharaoh investigated and found that not even one of the animals this is after another plague not even one of the animals of the Israelites had died Yet, his heart was unyielding, and he would not let the people go. Interestingly, the first five plagues, the Bible tells us, Pharaoh hardened his heart. It tells us that he was unyielding in his heart. And then upon the following plagues, in verse 12 in that same chapter, look how the phraseology changed. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart in verse 12. And he would not listen to Moses and Aaron just as the Lord had said to Moses. That Moses was telling Pharaoh, let my people go. And he was unyielding in his heart. And he was hardened in his heart. And then to the point now after not yielding in heart over and over and over and over again. God then gave him over to a hardened heart. The God himself says, now I'm going to have to display my power at a level that is going to rock your world. That's a scary set of scriptures. I wonder... When the scripture talks about this concept of not responding to God to the point where God gives us over, how many times is it? I'm not trying to form a theological basis that says it's five times and then you're given over. But there's a concept here that talks about if we're going to be unyielding to God and we're not going to give our heart that, oh, that there's going to come a time that God's going to say, man, I need to go to the next level to wake you up. <laughs> what is that? Health? Losing a job? Desperation? Homelessness?
Just a question. Is there something that you're unyielding in your heart towards God about? <laughs> Forgiveness? Bitterness? Rage? I need to be angry. Do you not see? I will not forgive. These people are just so wrong. What is it? What is it that you are unyielding about? The Pharaoh was so unyielding in his heart that God said, Okay, next level way to get your attention. Exodus chapter 12. Just, just something to think about. You know, I want to encourage you. Stuff that I say up here, if it's palatable to you, awesome. If it's like sometimes when you eat chicken, you need to spit out the bones, amen. That's all good. But let our hearts, let God work on our hearts so that ultimately we can be pleasing to him. Not because I say something, but because God is moving in your heart and you know his will. It's, it's easy for me now to say, um, to say no to someone. It's much harder to say no when I know God wants me to do something. When I know that God wants me to do something. If I'm involved in an immoral relationship. If I'm involved in adultery. If I'm stealing from work. And God knows. You know. Yet we might be unyielding in our hearts. Exodus chapter 12. In verse 31, we, we find out here that ultimately, after the final plague, the Pharaoh said, During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up! Leave my people, you and the Israelites, go worship the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said, and go. And by the way, bless me, please. <laughs> and so we find out in chapter 13, in verse 17, that they had left and God instituted a couple of ordinances that they needed to, uh, the, the Israelites needed to make sure that they remember the Passover and the feast on the unleavened bread. Very, very important. The Passover, of course, we know that's when ultimately that God said, in order for your children to be saved, you need to take blood, put it in your doorpost, so that when the angel of death comes across, the blood will be a protection. Of course, we know that's the foreshadowing of course, Christ and what he's done through because we have been rinsed we have been washed in his blood we too will not face ultimate death but we will actually survive and then he said i want you to the feast of the unleavened bread i want you to make sure that you guys remember this because you can't have stuff in your house that has any yeast in it you know what yeast is right Yeast causes, when you bake or you do something with it, it causes the stuff to rise. Well, it takes time for it to rise. Just let me give you a little bit, just a snippet of a, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. You know what they would do? If you were a Jew, you have to clean the entire house of anything that resembles yeast. For an entire week before you are celebrating that event itself. You know why? It was to remember what they went through and to never forget what was going on and the suffering that they endured, that needed to take bitter herbs when they were eating to remember the bitterness that they endured. 
And so literally what Jews would do, even to this day, they will either give away everything and when this time comes, give away everything in their house or sell it. But they rid their house of anything that resembles the yeast. So that they will understand what God did for them. In chapter 13, in verse 17, awesome scripture. It says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them in the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert toward the Red Sea, and the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. That God was so concerned now about the Israelites. He says, I'm not going to take any shortcuts for fear that they may go back to what they once were. Sometimes within the Christian life, we can't take shortcuts because you might face opposition that leads you to go back in to what we once were. And God, through His loving kindness, cords of loving kindness, I know it looks like we're not taking the shortest and the most expedient way to get to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I'm taking you to a way so that you don't have to fight unnecessary opposition. And I said, but you brought us to the Red Sea, and of course we know what happens, right? God pa uh, path, uh, opened the path of the Red Sea. And all, some say two million people, crossed the Red Sea. Emblematic, of course, of the baptism that we endure. That as they passed through the waters and entered into the side, in a few moments, we're going to watch Hayden and Brittany pass through the waters as they are going to enter on the red side, on the other side. We understand that the, this great redemptive story is not only about being freed from slavery, but it's a free from slavery to worship the Lord. Let me say that again. If, if, if it was merely liberation from the Egyptians, initially when they were just merely liberated and they were not worshiping the Lord in the desert, you remember the grumbling, the complaining, and God said, none of you would enter the land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to wait for 40 years until this generation passes, and then only those who are not of age and Joshua and Caleb could enter the land flowing with milk and honey. And God says, to this day now, he gives us to remember two things. Some of the religious world calls it sacraments. Let's think about the first one, the Lord's Supper that we took earlier today. It reminds and it points towards this great redemptive story. And as we take the blood, the wine that symbolizes the blood and the, the bread that symbolizes the body, we're remembering what Christ has done on our behalf. We remember the first redemptive story and then ultimately leads us to the ultimate redemptive story. And then this baptism that is going to occur here in a few minutes, that when I, I, I want to do justice to this, and I believe I, I'm going to read this, and we'll close with this. And uh, it's, it's called from a book called The Echoes of the Exodus. And I think it does a great job describing this, and I will do injustice uh, to, uh, to just talk about the idea of the Lord's Supper and baptism and, and not help you to understand the full understanding of what it is. So let me find it here for a second. Uh, da, 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 da. You guys with me? Yeah. Okay, great, awesome, fantastic. Uh, e e even if you weren't with me, I know you would uh, be nice about it and say uh, uh, that's, that's the case. That's one of the uh, 
that's one of the privileges. OK, here it is. The most obvious way we do that, talking here about the Exodus and remembering it, is by celebrating the sacraments. Consider, Jesus gave two sacraments to his church, and they both enact the Exodus. In baptism, we celebrate the burial of the old, the passing from death to life, the drowning of our enemies in flood waters. In the Eucharist, we remember how God ransomed us from slavery to sin and death through the blood of a lamb, uniting us both to him and to one another. Whenever we baptize someone or share in the Lord's Supper, we're witnessing to ourselves and to the world around us that all of us have known slavery. All of us live in a hope of a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and Israel's God stepped down to liberate us from the former and take us triumphantly into the latter. We are seeing more than that too. In baptism, we declare not only our liberation from the Pharaoh of sin, but we declare our new identity as a kingdom of priests to God. In baptism, we are baptized into the promised prophet who is greater than Moses. In baptism, we are manifested as those who join to the multitude of new people born again through divine deliverance. We are led by the pillar of the Spirit into a new creation. In baptism, we are washed in the same waters that were divided in the second and third days of creation, brought through the waters of the flood, carried through the trial of the forward of the Jabbok, and taken from the Red Sea. In baptism, our bodies are marked out for resurrection, for entrance into the new creation. We walk the same path as Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Israel, Ruth, Hannah, Samuel, David, Solomon, Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Ezra, Esther, and Nehemiah. We walk in the path of Jesus, the way of Exodus. Same things are true of this Lord's Supper. Every time we celebrate it, we are drawn back to the, to the Last Supper, to that night, and beyond that, to all of the many Exoduses and Passovers that preceded it. Not for nothing did Jesus tell us, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As we share the sacraments, our bodies are caught up in the rhythm of redemption, echoing our past deliverance, but also anticipating our future one. When we understand this redemptive story, it permeates into the most important event of our lives. It's not just a good story we tell in Joy Factory. It's a story that actually seeps into our very being all over. Understand it. Have eyes that see, have hearts that feel, ears that hear what is happening in this unbelievable redemptive story. We're going to share now in one of these quote unquote sacraments as we're going to watch a couple get baptized into Christ and pray that as we thought about these things and as I said a few words here, some of you are saying a little too many, but that's okay, I'll repent next time, uh, that we remember what God has done and how he, is re uh, uh, how he has delivered us. At this baptism, it's also a reminder, reminder of ours. And th that sea that we passed through, the deliverance that we received, and how we will tell about it from now until we enter the ultimate promised land. Thank you so much. We're going to head over if you are if you are so inclined to witness Hayden and Brittany get baptized unto Jesus Christ. <laughs>